Thank you all again for being here today. Uh, my name is Alex Fraser. I am the director of Issue One's Council for Responsible Social Media, and I'm very grateful to be moderating this session on conspiracy theories. It's a critical topic, and we're going to hear a lot from a very diverse and eclectic group of experts momentarily, but just to, to give us a little framing for the conversation today. Conspiracy theories have been around for pretty much all of human history. They can be shocking, intriguing, and increasingly dangerous. Things have shifted fundamentally in recent years with the advent of the internet, the proliferation of social media, and now with the supercharged power of generative AI, these technologies without proper guardrails and education can lead to a dystopian future when, as Peter, one of our panelists writes, nothing is true and everything is possible. As these theories take hold, they can have real, very real consequences offline. Conspiracy theories can imperil US national security as our adversaries seek to exploit our open environment, free speech, and weaponize our own technology and our own companies against us. It can threaten the safety of healthcare workers and election officials and fundamentally underline, undermine elections and democracy itself. And for many of us, it can have a, a personal impact as well as it can tear families and friends apart. I know I'm not alone in this, but I have lost a friend to conspiracy theories. Someone very close to me who went too far down the YouTube and Reddit rabbit holes, who never really emerged the same. And this has had tremendously negative impacts on his life and our friendship. And unfortunately, the current state of affairs is not good. According to some recent polling by Imran's organization, the Center for Countering Digital Hate, 49% of Americans agree with at least four statements which align with common conspiracy theories. In other words, almost half of Americans are deeply misinformed. And sadly, the future does not look bright either, because when you go to teenagers, 13 to 17 year olds, this gets even worse to 60%. And over time, with the supercharged power of social media and AI, conspiracism will eat away at the broader information ecosystem and make it difficult to differentiate fact from fiction and truly rot democracy to the core unless something is done to address this. And that is what we're here to talk about today. This challenge and the ways in which we can, the opportunities we have to make a difference. I'm truly grateful to be joined by an incredible group of speakers. Um, I'm gonna briefly introduce them and then start this conversation. First, Imram Ahmed, whom I mentioned a moment ago. He is the founder and CEO of the Center for Countering Digital Hate and a council member for the Issue One's Council for Responsible Social Media. Imran formed CCDH to develop solutions against online hate and misinformation in the wake of the UK's 2016 Brexit referendum. During this time, he witnessed the rise of radical violence and anti-Semitism in the UK and the murder of his colleague and close friend, Joe Cox, who was an MP, by a white supremacist. Prior to this, Imran served as a senior political advisor to the shadow foreign secretary, Hillary Benn, and has had a lot of other tremendous experience in UK politics. Peter Pomerantsev is a senior fellow at Johns Hopkins University, SNF Agora Institute, where he co-directs the ARENA Initiative, a research project that aims to address the challenges of, digital, of the digital era, disinformation, and polarization. He's also a well-celebrated author, and his literary work has numerous awards and crit uh, great critic praise. His most recent book, This Is Not Propaganda, was a Times Magazine Book of the Year. Last, but certainly not least, we have Nelly Gorbea. Uh, Secretary Nelly Gorbea served as Rhode Island's Secretary of State for nearly a decade until January of 2023. And following her, her role as Secretary of State, she continues her contributions to American democracy as a visiting senior fellow at Salve Regina University's Pell Center. Uh, throughout her career, Secretary Gorbea has dedicated herself to supporting underrepresented populations in politics. And we're just delighted to have you and all of the speakers here today. One, one note for the uh, the audience is if you have a question, please put it into the chat. Uh, we, we will be doing a Q&A session at the end of the, of the panel. We will welcome any and all questions as they come up. Uh, so thank you for that. So let's jump right into it. Uh, we're gonna start with setting some historical context. I'd love to start with Peter and answer this basic question. How would you define a conspiracy theory? 
So look, I, I don't need to define it. It's 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 defined in in many dictionaries, and um, you know, it usually denotes some sort of secret plot, usually illegal, um, in order to to do damage to unwitting people. Um, and and I wonder how useful it is actually as a category for what we're trying to talk about today. Because look, it's also a legal term. Um, I did a documentary once about how um, you know the fight to recognize how tobacco causes cancer and at the end the at the end of the trial the judge said tobacco companies have been created a conspiracy to defy to deny the evidence that tobacco smoking causes cancer so it's a legal term so i think really what we're talking about today is is not just conspiracy theories which which can often be true but kind of what 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 some sort of researchers call a conspiratorial mindset and, and that's a mindset that assumes that even when there's evidence and plenty of evidence that there is no conspiracy, there's other explanations for an event. You go, oh, no, no, there was some sort of secret plot. And for me, as someone who studies propaganda and democratic communication or the lack of it, for me, the telltale sign when somebody has crossed from, you know, the absolutely rational potential search for an actual conspiracy theory to a conspiratorial mindset is when you can no longer have any kind of conversation with them based on evidence, because they'll always go, you may have given me evidence, but I know that you're really from the CIA and therefore everything you say, I dismiss. And that I think is the great danger um, to society, um, to, de to democracy, which really depends on us having some sort of shared idea of what evidence is to, to function. So I think that's really what we're talking about here, not just conspiracy theories, which sometimes are true, often aren't true, but actually a conspiratorial mindset that despite the evidence will say, oh, no, there's a secret plot somewhere, thus destroying the potential for any kind of mutual understanding and conversation. Um, I'll pause there. I can go on for a long, long time. Uh, there, there's a lot of my books about conspiracy theories how they've changed, what role they play now, as opposed to like maybe just a few decades ago. But but I think that's really a, a very, a, a, like a, a good place to start to start our conversation from. Um, uh, so so I'll, I'll pause if that's enough. Th thank you, Peter. Uh, Nelly or Imran, would you want to add yeah. anything to that before we jump into how technology has changed the game for conspiracy theories? Yeah, no, I think, you know, the way that uh, Peter has just described it is, is, is a very good one and, and fits very well with what's happened with elections, right? Uh, you have actual paper ballots, there's an actual number tally, and yet people don't believe the results. And that's a real challenge because there's nowhere you can go with it. You, you just, I mean, you have the evidence, it's right in front of you, but the other person will not believe that they lost the election or will purport not to believe that they lost the election. Uh, so this is taken front and center within, and the elections, they may be wonderful, transparent, they could be very accurate, but they don't work if people don't believe the results. I mean, if, if I can posit a different way of looking at it and acknowledge everything that's been said to date, but you know, we are worried about conspiracy theories. It's 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 seen as a, a mildly pejorative term, right? A conspiracy theory. And the question is why? And why is it so difficult to define it? I mean, it, it's like junk food. What is junk food? Because a hamburger, theor and you know, I went to med schools, so like a hamburger theoretically is just a composition of carbohydrates, proteins, fats, etc. a few nutrients here and there, other nutrients here and there. Is it necessarily a bad thing? No, but if you eat 10 in a day, you're going to get pretty sick. And if you eat them 10 a day every day for 365 days a year, that's really problematic. And we understand it in that respect. Who's consuming these things obsessively? Who has that conspiratorial mindset? Who's obsessively looking for it? And there is some psychological evidence, for example, the epistemic anxiety. So this deep yearning for certainty a deep uncertainty about how to find information out is highly correlated with conspiracist ideation. And that, that, is, that is exacerbated by a chaotic information system, ecosystem. So if you have a chaotic information ecosystem, you're more likely to have epistemic anxiety and therefore more likely to be vulnerable to conspiracy theories. 
And that is, you know, P Peter writes about the Soviet Union and, and post-Soviet Russia. One of my colleagues, um, my development director, grew up in the Soviet Union in Siberia um, for her first eight years before moving to Maryland. And, you know, we talk about this all the time. And she says, when you can't tell what's true or not, even though you desperately want to know what's true or not, you basically give up. You're at, you, you're at least this sort of state of apathetic nihilism almost. And that is... That is one of the things that we are now seeing emerge in, in, a, in a variety of movements around the world, whether it's, you know, some of the stuff that I saw with Brexit seven years ago in the UK or the state of American politics today. And none of us feel that that is sustainable because we, we, we feel that it's toxic. In fact, it's antithetical to the values that underpin democracy. And that's that's a great segue here, Imran. Thank you so much. Uh, so. Taking this point of the conspiratorial mindset that Peter laid out for us, and now we go to the emergence of social media, technology. And Ima, I'd like to pass it back to you momentarily to talk about the research that I highlighted at the top of this call and talk about what you all have learned and how you see things evolving with the emergence of technology as it stands today. So, so, so let's get to the basics of why it, why it matters that this that that why does social media change things? Fundamentally, this is about economics. It's zero marginal cost for each additional message to each additional person. And that is game changing. That's the, it's comparing the conventional arms race to the nuclear arms race. It's the creation of unlimited amounts of communications from one initial input, you know, amplified by an algorithmic wave that prioritizes disinformation and hate because they're engaging, because they get us going, because they make us go, ooh, that's new. Um, or that's different and interesting. It's a different way. It's, it's, it, it, or just that's outrageous. That's ridiculous. And we still engage with it because that's what our brains do. And it's the design of the platforms that we know that algorithmically they supercharge the potency and reach of these conspiracies. It's the network effect of bad actors who cunningly amplify hate and disinformation by acting in a networked way, spreading things using the unique mathematics and physics of those platforms. 50 people each tweet. They then retweet each other. They like each other. That's 5,000 notifications, 50 times 50 times two. And our brains go, 5,000 people are saying this. That means 500,000 people must feel it. But actually, it's not multiplied by 100. It's divided by 100 to get the real number. And that's how the fringe wacky conspiracy theories are then rocketed into the center, the mainstream of political discourse. But also, I mean, we've seen things like our study Malgorithm showed that if you start following an algorithm stuff about anti-vax or about COVID conspiracies, it started feeding you um, QAnon and anti-Semitic conspiracy mm -hmm. theories and vice versa. The algorithms recognize people with a conspiratorial mindset and feed them other, they cross fertilize these conspiracies. Then often you see hybridization of these conspiracies happening later on. So you've got this incredible, um, this this perfect agar jelly for the for the for the production of vast amounts of conspiracy theory. Their cross fertilization, the creation of new species of even more toxic conspiracy, and then platforms don't do anything about it. So even when platforms still used to pretend that they cared about disinformation and hate, which Mr. Musk, for example, at X really doesn't, you know, they were very poor actually enforcing those rules that they had against disinformation and the hateful conspiracy theories, for example. And conspiracy theories are serious. They can lead to real world harm. Let's take, for, for example, at the moment, this massive rise in anti-Semitic hate that's happening. You know, Jews better than, know better than anyone else, whether it's the blood libel 2000 years ago, it's the great, it's the um, protocols of the elders of Zion in the last century that informed Hitler and his ideology, or it's the great replacement theory today that led to the massacre at the Tree of Life synagogue in Pittsburgh. Uh, we know that conspiracy theories and hate are, are often fundamentally interlinked as well. But platforms fail to act 89% of the time, even when you report it to them. So when people break their rules, only one in 10 times do they bother to do something about it. And they've been very, very bad at actually enforcing those rules. So you've got a permissive environment where people are, 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 know that they're allowed to get away with it. But you also have the, the algorithmic amplification, the acceleration of the dissemination of these conspiracies. 
Th thanks so much, Imran. Uh, I'm going to open up here to Nellie or Peter to jump in. Yeah. On. Yeah, no, I mean, what Imran is saying is absolutely correct. I mean, it's it's the the weaponization that is brought uh, to this to this conspiratorial uh, sort of activities th through the technology, because there's been misinformation, disinformation in political circles forever. Um, and, and prior to this in the prep call, you know, Alex and I talked about, you know, Chile. And, and in fact, the U.S. has participated as a government in other foreign lands in trying to misinform or disinform, you know, for their own interests. And so uh, what's what's happening now, though, is that that we're in a wild west where there are no controls. And it's the Achilles heel of American democracy that because, you know, we, we value and we treasure our, our freedom of speech, government is loath to get involved in anything that might even come close to, to being a control on that. I mean, that is the purpose from which our country was born. You know, the group of people who came over from the mainstream and, and started, you know, I mean, who came over across the, the Atlantic and started this country and, and took over the land, um, really were looking for complete freedom of speech of what they thought was right. And so it's embedded in our DNA and it's very hard for us. I think it's fascinating how Europe has developed a whole other way of dealing with technology and content uh, that's very different uh, than the way the U.S. is managing it. But the but the bulk of these companies are here in the U.S. Peter, anything to add here? I think I think a lot, but 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 I think um, Imran uh, focus on a, a little a little point there, which which I hope we talk about today as well, which is the kind of the demand side for for propaganda, for disinformation, and in this case, for conspiracy theories. Because we can talk about the supply side a lot, where obviously technology and distribution is key, but but also we need to think about the demand side. So why are they so appealing in the first place? And, and you talked about anxiety um, and the research that we've done at Arena, we saw is very linked to people feeling they don't have a control over their lives. You know, they feel that, you know, historically um, um, or, or in their personal lives that they haven't had much dictation over their lives. Uh, and on the other way around, I've, I've sat in focus groups where people will reject conspiracy theories because they say, I control my own life. I don't need any of this, whatever whatever this stuff is. I don't need it. Um, and and that's very interesting. I mean, I do think that's also connected to the technology because I can see maybe why the sort of vast proliferation of content makes people feel anxious and out of control. And so they go looking for the conspiracy theory. So they could be a bad circle that we're in. Uh, but also, I think, gives us the clue to to the comprehensive solution. Sure, part of the solution, of course, will be, um, you know, thinking about how um, technology companies have to take more responsibility for the harms uh, that their content can cause. And I think we are talking about really specific harms now to people's lives, to people's health and to um, electoral processes. You know, this is not just you know, lies and disinformation that, that we, we can start really talking about the harms of some of these, some of these, um, so, so, so some of this content. But also we have to, start, if we really want to start doing something about it, we have to really think about um, why there is a demand for it and how we uh, reach out to audiences who are, um, who are vulnerable to this sort of content. Uh, at the end of the day, as you say, it's freedom of speech territory. And there's only so much you can do to stymie the flow of content. Uh, I think there are some things we can do, but they should be limited in a democracy. And so it is up to us to compete. And I think it's perfectly possible to compete with the people who provide this content. The problem is there's very, very little motivation to compete. There is a huge and obvious financial and often political motivation to spread conspiracy theories, often a geopolitical one. Um, but there isn't much of one to do something about it. Uh, and I wonder how we tackle that as well. No, it's it's a great point, and it it leads to the next question about how how we're impacted. Different communities are impacted by these this conspiratorial mindset by conspiracy theories writ large. And so, Nelly, I'd like to go to you. You oversaw elections for nearly a decade in Rhode Island, and you saw different communities in the impact. And you've had a particular interest in this for a lot of your career. So, can you talk to us a little bit about how you've seen this differentiate across communities? Sure. Um, and it's and so for, for those watching, so my, my native language is actually Spanish. And so one of the things that I've been um, really concerned about is how does 
misinformation, disinformation, malinformation, all of these conspiracy theories uh, propagate within mediums other than English language. Because what I found over the years um, being Secretary of State is that while content that was truly wrong content or, 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 or egregious content was taken down in English, it is allowed to exist in Spanish. And I can only imagine that it's being allowed to exist in other languages as well by the media companies. Now, you know, you know, why is this a problem? Well, like the number of people in the United States who speak a language other than English at home has nearly tripled, according to the U.S. Census Bureau. Uh, so we've gone from one in 10 to one in five. And then, you know, if you take the, the largest language dominant um, the group, which is Spanish speaking, you find that they are more users of social media than than the average population. So civic science did a study where like 85% of Hispanic Americans say they use social media compared to 80%. I mean, there's 5% more than, than, than the mainstream. Uh, and so you have them consuming these this information and, and not thinking critically about what they're consuming and then reposting it through the WhatsApp and uh, you know all of this, the 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 communication social media apps. Um, so you know, it, really scarily enough, uh, uh, the National Association of Latino Elected Officials uh, Educational Fund, which has been following this subject uh, for a while, noted they they did a survey on where Latino voters get their political news. Forty four percent of them say that they're using YouTube, uh, and then there's a whole other chunk that's getting it on Facebook. And so these are basically, again, Wild West sort of people will post whatever they want. And if it seems like it's reasonable, they just repost it to their family and friends. And suddenly I was on a panel on a TV station in Florida doing an interview during the 2020 uh, election and trying to refute the, the other person on the panel who was talking about Dominion voting machines being wired uh, in, 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 in programmed in, in Venezuela uh, and, and, and knowing that this is wrong. Uh, and yet, you know, it, it's just, it's really become a problem in, in not other in communities that speak languages other than English. Uh, thanks so much, Nelly. Uh, Imran, I'd like to turn back to you here. Talk, go back to your research and talk about young people and the, who use in terms of how people are getting their news. Nelly just quoted, number of Latinos getting their their news off of YouTube. When we go to news and information, young people are a much, much higher level. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you've learned and how you see things shaking out with that generation in terms of our democracy and, and broadly about how conspiracy theories are impacting that? So uh, a few months ago, we conducted some polling with Servation in the US and UK uh, with a thousand adults and a thousand children in each country. And I mean, the actual aim of the research was to inform our policy solutions, which, uh, you know, for the, what we call the star framework, safety by design, transparency of the algorithms, accountability to democratic bodies and shared responsibility for systemic harms with both you know, the public and, and the companies themselves. And we found majority support for that. But because we had some spare questions, I put in a bank of conspiracy questions. So to what extent do you believe that there is any merit to these nine conspiracies? And what we found really, really surprised us because we found that 14 to 17 year olds were the most conspiracies. They were the most likely to believe each of the nine conspiracy theories and all of the nine conspiracy theories as well that we put forwards. Now, one of them was, for example, an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. So we asked them, do you think that Jews control our economy, the media and our politics? 34% of adults agreed in the US, 43% of 14 to 17 year olds. And then we cut the data and looked at heavy social media users and it was 54%. And those sorts of numbers are really, really, you know, surprising and, 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 and disturbing to us. I mean, we also asked a more general, you know, is there a deep state? We asked them, you know, they're more likely to believe conspiracy theories that anthropogenic climate change isn't happening, more likely to believe, would you believe transphobic conspiracy theories? 
um, there was a whole array of these in which we saw this relationship where, where we saw kids are more likely to believe. So that first generation of kids who grew up on algorithmically amplified short form video platforms, TikTok, Instagram Reels, YouTube Shorts, that generation has imbibed and believed more conspiracy than any other age cohort in our, in our study. Now that, you know, the sorts of numbers we're seeing where a majority of 13 to 17 year olds believe a raft of conspiracy theories, that feels concerning to me. I can't tell you that it's that it means that our democracy is under threat, but it certainly doesn't make me feel that our democracy is safe. Thank you. Peter, you want to jump in on this? Well, uh, I think that, no, you know, it's very interesting looking at the, the the data among among young people and and very very worrying um but 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 i think that um you know i think the connection is is very much between a sense of instability confusion and and so on we really have to think about what, what do conspiracy theories provide people uh maybe teens are particularly um vulnerable to that but but i think many segments in society can be um, and and that is, uh, you know, as Imran said, they can give you some sort of epistemological comfort in a confusing world. Um, I think even more so, they give you a sense of community of us versus them. It's us. There's a conspiracy against us by somewhere around outside. And in a time when kind of both social identities, but also sort of communities are, are changing very fast, um, that can create a huge amount of 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 comfort. Um, there's a great line from Jacques Ellul, my favorite philosopher of propaganda, that propaganda is the remedy for loneliness. And, and I think that's very, very true. I think uh, the rise of conspiracy theories during COVID, when everybody was very atomized, all our usual social bonds were broken, and you saw this ups, upsurge of conspiracy theories, is no accident. Um, and and I, I, I would dwell on that moment for, for a little bit. I mean, uh, I guess these are young people who, who, who I had a teenager who went through COVID. Um, very, very strange. If you're growing up um, um, in a time of COVID, you lose sort of two years of your socialization. I could see a whole generation mm -hmm. um, really pushed into mm -hmm. social media and a sense of complete confusion about their communities um as covid was happening I, I wonder whether that has played a, a a big role for that that generation um and, and i think it's very important to keep in mind so well, it's not just epistemology it's it's a feeling of community often a pair a feeling of superiority because you're in, you're in on a secret it's very very important i remember one really interesting piece of research by the institute for strategic dialogue about uh qanon conspiracies where actually a lot of the people in the conspiracies didn't know the details of it and before that they'd been into pizzagate so they were jumping from conspiracy th to conspiracy theory without necessarily knowing all the details. So it wasn't just about knowledge. It was very much about community. And again, as we start to work those things out, again, I think there's very important elements to, to discern as we think about how we can um, counteract it. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. Uh, we're about to enter into another election year, another biggest election of our lives, of, of our future of our democracy, et cetera. And obviously the information environment has continued to play a huge role in this. So as we approach 2024, how does the presence of this conspiratorial mindset and these, these conspiracy theories online affect US elected officials? Nelly, I would love to turn to you to give us a little flavor of how this has impacted you and how you see it impacting all of your colleagues around the country. Sure, well, you know, it, it's been incredibly detrimental. Uh, you know, it's making it increasingly difficult for election officials to do their job um, because conspiracy theories and these in this mindset is is really a corrosive uh, force in our democracy. Um, I remember back when we first discovered or, or we were first informed as secretaries of state of what happened in 2016 with regards to, you know, the Russian um, attacks and the other foreign actors uh, through the bots, the Bernie bots and the Facebook accounts and all that. Um, I remember thinking, oh, wow, like I need to make sure that the clerks in our city and town halls understand what's going on in the greater world, because they're the ones who will have their neighbors show up and say, I heard that, you know, our election machines don't work right. Uh, and, and they'll need to talk to them now about 
you know, what, how it is that we protect our democracy, how it is that we protect integrity in our elections. They, they're not just there as clerks to just take in the information. They now have to be ambassadors for the democracy. And we're going to have to do that more and more and more. The stress level on election officials uh, is monumental. And uh, people in, in across the U.S., particularly in battleground states, you're seeing people be threatened, their families be threatened. I mean, the Secretary of State of Michigan couldn't go jogging in her neighborhood because of sniper threats. I mean, it's really developed into this whole other level of threat um, that's very personal to the election officials. Um, and this drumbeat of there's fraud in the voter rolls and, you know, Trump won the 2022 election. It's so damaging uh, that we really uh, need to somehow figure out a way to get people to take a step back. And, and I agree, content can't be all regulated because we do believe in, in, in the freedom of, of speech. Uh, but we need to start teaching critical thinking skills around media absorption uh, in our schools uh, to be able to get them to stop pause before they reshare something that really is not true. Um you're previewing we'll get to solutions in a moment that's a great preview yep. uh before i move on i just want to remind the audience that uh if you have a question please plug it into the chat we're going to have some time for q a at the end so just a reminder to folks if you have a question please to throw that into the chat i want to pivot now to peter again and i want to talk about conflict international conflict there's wars all around the world people know about ukraine and, and the middle east but there's obviously a lot more conflict than that going on as well but these two have really heightened things and 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 brought uh, the information environment and its role to the the forefront. So I wanted to to ask you, uh, you you know this quote this phrase I noted at the beginning: nothing is true and everything is possible. I'd like you to talk us through what that means and how does this phrase relate to what you're seeing play out in between Israel and Hamas, in Russia and Ukraine and elsewhere around the world. Um, sure. Um, so the the phrase was. Uh, my attempt to diagnose what I saw in Russia um, in the sort of first decade of the of the Putin era. Um, and um, my first book was called that. And it's a, it was about a sort of propaganda whose aim was much less to convince you of some sort of clear ideology based on, I don't know, an idea of history or something, the way communism did. And a different type of propaganda, which is try to spread so much chaos and confusion, people couldn't tell the difference between truth and facts, which led to the apathy that Imran mentioned, and a kind of, you know, a sort of despair about any kind of democratic engagement. But also, I think, and we see this in study after study, when people become super cynical about information sources, they don't end up free and liberated, they actually get driven towards um, a malign version of identity politics. I mean, where the only thing that matters is is your identity and, and often a very propaganda constructed identity that's very aggressive and, and, and paranoid. Um, so you don't end up, and this is the, the, this is the great paradox that the, when you reach an extreme point of skepticism towards everything, you don't end up the sort of liberated rational thinker, you end up the opposite, almost in a sort of medieval mindset. Where, where there are shadowy forces you can't see controlling the world and life is, is fearful and you cling on to an identity that's often provided by, by the propagandists. I mean, in the case of Russia, it's a sort of a, a Russian imperial identity that no one can really explain in great detail. It's just a sense, you know, there's, you can't trust anything out there, but we know that we're Russian and everyone's out to get us and we've got to hit them first. It's kind of what you end up with. So that's what I was talking about. Um, in 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 the current war uh, in um, in 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 you know in Israel Palestine, um, I, I I think that um, um, you know we have several moments in the war where where even when the evidence was put forward, for example, around the sort of the the the, the the bombing of 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 the hospital early on in the war, where everyone sort of jumped to their own conclusions, and even when the evidence was then rolled out. It was sort of too late. It turned out that sort of a, I think Islamic Jihad or something had had hit one of their own hospitals through a technical fault. But already it was too late. There were huge sort of crowds uh, protesting an Israeli war crime and, and so on and so forth. So I think that that, that could be a, a, a small example where really evidence and truth don't matter anymore, and just we're in a in a space where 
everyone is just taking any piece of content to defend their their biases. Um, so, so I think I think I think that that, that that's an example um, in that particular conflict. But but I mean, in in many ways, um, the divisions in in that conflict are so deep and in some ways very very genuine. I think it's almost much more interesting when you see it really come out of of nowhere and sort of a vicious polarization um, appear where where there didn't seem to be one, or when you lose a friend or a family member to to an identity that that that, that was never there before and as much really sort of created through propaganda and like QAnon would be a really really radical example to think about. Um, so so you know there, there are huge cleavages already that that various types of propaganda and conspiratorial propaganda can can play into. But what's really interesting is what is when they kind of really appear in in spaces where where they weren't before or we'd never noticed a cleavage there. Uh, Imran or Nelly, two two minutes. Any quick reactions to this question to add on? Well, no. I mean, I just think that all of this has really played a, a major role in elections. I mean, since the twenty sixteen elections, uh, secretaries of state and other election officials have been really trying to, you know, manage the the conflict that has arisen from conspiracy theories being so easily accessed and absorbed by the general public. And so um, I remember vividly one of the sessions from the uh, from CISA, the Cybersecurity Information Security Agency, uh, basically saying, look, they're not creating new uh, new problems. They're basically exploiting the existing problems in our society. And that's what the algorithms are doing, the bots are doing. Um, uh, you know, a, a, a very quick story about about the 2016 election, I, you know, we woke up on on the presidential preference primary day uh, to a barrage on Facebook on our Facebook account for the office, uh, saying that we had somehow controlled the primary to benefit uh, Hillary Clinton instead of Bernie Sanders, and the my office has nothing to do with the actual running of elections. There's a separate agency in our state that runs the day of election because I'm an elected official, so. We were very calmly, very, you know, we would just send out, we prepared a text and we'd send it out and then three more would show up. And, and it was a really odd interaction, but we didn't really know what was going on. And we kept very rationally trying to respond to these people. I finally basically decided I didn't really care because it was all these people from anywhere outside of Rhode Island. So they were not Rhode Islanders who were complaining about our elections. Um, fast forward and analyzing all the, all the traffic. It ended up being that these conspiracy theories are part of this bot attack that's known as the Bernie Bros. Uh, they just happened to use the Hillary Clinton, Bernie Sanders divisions of that moment uh, to try to put a wedge in between everyone around that particular election. And so, yeah, it's 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 stuff that now election officials just have to face and and figure out new tools in which to communicate with voters and say, no, we really do have methods to control for the integrity of elections so that we don't lose the trust in our elections. Yeah. No, and thank you for that. Uh, Nelly, it's a really important point to tie this all together back to our elections here. So we have two other questions we want to get through on our side before we open up to the Q&A. And I, I want to just briefly ask this question to you all to, to have very quick responses, but I want to do a whip around. We think about the emergence of deep fakes, generative AI, and the current ecosystem that we have uh, in the information environment. What are the implications for democracy if we don't make changes in the U.S. and around the world? And if we could, I'll do start with Imran, and we'll just do quick responses on this one. So, so, so in the, look, there's there's two concerns here. The first is that you've got the drip, drip. I mean, th like January the sixth wasn't a disinformation moment; it was mobilization of the already disinformed. It's the drip, drip of disinformation over years and years. The frequency bias that makes people believe that the untrue is true because they see it so frequently. Um, and those those happen over a period of years, recoloring the lens through which people see the world so that in the moment they can be activated. And right now we're seeing that we're not seeing a lot of disinformation right now about Israel, Palestine. It's mobilization. It's here's a dead baby. We told you about the Jews. Now go and hurt them. You know, um, I think. And, and that's the one is that we've got to be able, we've got to be scientific about distinguishing what's mobilization, what's disinformation. How does how does often correct information if promulgated again and again and again and again to someone 
on a, on, on a disproportionately frequent basis start to recolor their understanding of the world around them. We just have to be more mature about it. The second thing that I think that I'm, I'm, I'm deeply concerned about, though, is that if you have a generation that do not believe in the possibility of there being objective facts that we can all agree on, and generative AI's biggest problem isn't just about the flooding of disinformation, the, the zero cost for producing it, but also the fact that it, you know, if the, if the Billy Bush tape or whatever it was came out today, you know, someone could just say, that's a deep fake, not true. And so if you can't even believe what you see or hear with your own eyes and ears, it just lends greater, it, it creates even more anxiety about certainty mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 in, and the insufficiency of understanding of facts. And I go back to sort of thinking about Thomas Hobbes and what he wrote about the state of nature. He's a 17th century British philosopher. He said, you know, it's the state of nature where no one can trust anyone else. No one knows what anyone else believes. And so therefore you don't know whether or not you can trust them. Well, that is a recipe for a pretty dire state of human of human life. You know, yeah. nasty short sure, lives. Yeah, I mean, I think that the danger here is we lose our democracy, right? It becomes easier to trust somebody who's going to tell me what to do under an authoritarian regime than than to actually engage with others in 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 a democracy and so i mean to me we need to absolutely be talking about this we need to, we need more communication we need more critical thinking skills being taught in schools we need more civics for people to understand what the systems are um and then we need metrics uh you know the pell center just um did a survey in rhode island around polarization and we need to measure this stuff and have the information to see whether we're gaining or not because data is going to be key to help us figure out you know sort of what the path is yeah peter as, as you think about crafting your response here in terms of the, the implications for our democracy i'm gonna ask you also then to give your answer to the last question which is what do we do to fix this mm. what are the solutions that we have going forward to really ensure that this does not erode and destroy our democracy as nelly just pointed to uh, I mean, look, there's this sort of like um, mitigation strategy um, um, and, you know, I think I think I agree. I completely agree with Imran. We have to decide what it is specifically we're trying to mitigate. Yeah. So so what is let's start with the harms and, and, and work backwards because trying to police all speech is, is, is going to be too complicated. Yeah. So so at the very basic level, it's, it's protecting, you know, public health harms, institutions like elections from harm so we have to start with that i mean um and and that might involve uh you know well it'll involve a combination of more responsibility from tech platforms sort of defining very clearly what we mean by these harms and where their responsibilities are i mean something like QAnon, i think definitely we saw how that jumped from you know the various eight chans bit of the internet onto YouTube into the almost the mainstream. So that was there was a clear moment where the tech companies could see potentially something building and have a responsibility from that jump not happening. Again, again, it's not about policing all types of speech. I do think you 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 start from the harm. There's a risk to our elections, there's a risk to public health, there's a risk to child safety. And then you move backwards from that. So there is partly something that the tech companies can be responsible for. Again, I'm not, I think censorship is always going to be very hard but some sort of um, slowing down of how this disinformation spreads to make sure that it doesn't release a torrent, um, which is also algorithmically driven. You know, it's not as if like technology is not involved in every step of the way in this process. Yeah. Um, that has to appear. Um, but the other, the other part is understanding audiences. We're in a race with the propagandists to who understands audiences better. And we saw this with COVID. I mean, that was a clear case where there was a public health risk to conspiracy theories. We saw it with COVID in, in, in my kind of quasi hometown. I, I work at Johns Hopkins. I live in Baltimore. There was a lot of skepticism about pe from people in Baltimore about, you know, the, the, whether you could trust vaccines. But that was built on centuries of mm -hmm. uh, a sense of essentially uh, abuse by, you know, by, by the medical, academic medical tradition in, in Baltimore towards the local, the, the local popula population, which, which people will know through amazing books like about Henrietta Lacks. So there was a genuine history of distrust there. And so maybe some people are committed conspiracy theorists, you'll never reach them, but many others are, are distrustful because of understandable reasons. 
I did research in Estonia and bits of Ukraine around distrust of vaccines. A lot of the people distrusted them because of their memory of Chernobyl. They have a deep, deep distrust of public health programs. Um, you know, they, they, they felt they were lied to during Chernobyl. You can't trust what the government tells you about health. Why should we trust them today? So look, you can address these things, but you've really got to understand audiences. Yes, some will be extremists who who just have a supremacist agenda that they're pursuing through conspiracy theories others will be reachable so we it's both you know there is a, a responsibility from the distributors the demo, the supply side of, of these issues and there's a more effort that we have to do in the communication side and, and between those things we can start mitigating the harms but but we are talking about mitigation you know let's let's be realistic and and I think it's very important to be very precise about what it is we're stopping. Just stopping disinformation, just stopping conspiracy theories, that's too vague. It really has to be we're protection, protecting election integrity, we're protecting public health, and then we can take action. Thank you, Peter. So we're running out of time, so I want to make sure we get some of the audience questions. So Imran, if I could ask you one minute or, or in change on your solutions to all of these big problems. Oh, I mean, look, that... that as you know, that's what we spend our time doing at the Centre for Counter and Digital Hate. I was uh, the first witness to give evidence to the British Online Safety Bill Committee in 2019, and that became law a few weeks ago. Um, with the Digital Services Act, we're working with EU regulators, and in the US, we've you know we've been advocating for our star framework, um, the thing that I said that we'd been polling earlier on. And that says what we need is transparency of the algorithms. We need transparency of the economics. We need transparency of content enforcement decisions. If you've got a rule, how have you enforced it? What decision did you take and why? Because that helps us to build up a corpus of understanding of, of what those rules mean in practice. The second thing that you need is once you've got transparency, you need meaningful accountability to well-informed you know, democratic lawmakers or regulatory bodies. And you know, uh, I think uh, Elizabeth Warren and uh, Lindsey Graham have got a, a bill right now on creating a sort of a uh, FCC for the social media. So a proper body that can ask tough questions. But then you also need shared responsibility. It can't all be on the backs of society to absorb the externalities of these companies and the problems they cause. So how do you find some way to make sure they share in the cost to disincentivize the production of those harms in the first instance and to create a culture of safety by design? So transparency, accountability, responsibility and safety by design. Now that's spelled TARS. But we changed it to STAR because TARS isn't as good as STAR when you're trying to name a framework. Def definitely not as good. So well done there and your team. Um, Nelly, one minute, please. Last word on how do we solve these big problems? Oh, wow. Well, I love both Peter and Inram's uh, accounts. The only other thing that I can say is um, there's some really good work being done on, on media literacy that is that I'm a big fan of because it speaks to people doing those critical thinking skills. And so um, that's what I would point to is, is education and communication are key to solving this more than anything else. That's right. So with that, I'm gonna pass it to my colleague, Willa Blake, who's gonna jump into the Q and A. Thanks, Alex. Um, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Willa, I'm an associate with the council. Um, thank you all again for being here and thank you to our wonderful panel. Um, I'm now going to take this time to take a few questions that I've received from the audience, um, starting with a question from Nicole, which is a long one, so let me know if I need to repeat it. Um, we continue to hear about the difficulty in tackling the conspiratorial mindset due to the First Amendment considerations in the U.S. In fact, Meta decided last year to allow election-denying advertisements on its platforms claiming free speech. Do you think platforms have a responsibility to view paid content slash advertising differently than content generated by users? And furthermore, are there content neutral changes that could limit the spread of disinformation without implicating the First Amendment? We can start with you, Imran. Well, look, platforms have the right to make decisions for themselves. And, you know, another part of the model of what CCDH does is we produce these reports which create a public um, which create public awareness and often outrage over the way that platforms behave uh, in reality. That's why people like Francis Haugen have been so instrumental in showing us these platforms know that there is a problem, but they choose not to do anything about it. Um, but also the advertisements. I mean, look, these paid advertisers, these paid advertisements, which are 
which are denying reality, which are spreading conspiracy the theories, which are under which are undermining our democracy. The truth is that a lot of other advertisers will be horrified to be using a platform that allows those sorts of ads to run, and they have a there's a, there's a you know that th they have a a voice in that in that as well. But I mean, I'm not surprised to hear that Meta has made a decision to do that. The truth is that you can't force them to not do that. But you can certainly make them pay a price in terms of reputation and potentially economically through through other advertisers as well. Other speakers have anything they want to add to that? OK, then um, the next question comes from Maddie. Um, what is the most promising solution supply side and promising demand side solution that you are seeing or wish to see that responds to the proliferation of mis and disinformation and its ampli amplification through social media? Any market driven solutions? I, I like the, the the greater transparency that Imran's uh, organization's pushing. I, as somebody who had to live her life in transparency in government, I can tell you it cures a lot of ills in terms of what people might do. So um, so I'm a big fan of, of that as a, as a big solution, uh, along with the media literacy that I spoke about. But transparency needs accountability as well. It yeah. needs it needs meaningful sanctions and so meaningful sharing of responsibility. And, you know, that's the problem with transparency is a silver bullet. There is there is no silver bullet is the truth to any of this. It's going to this is a systemic problem a 20 year experiment we've run on our society and on our children. And we need a systemic solution to it. And one that's adaptable, it's not gonna be, a, you know, one framework in place isn't gonna work straight, it won't work straight away and it won't work forever. You're gonna need to adapt and iterate on it. So what we need is confident lawmaking, confident regulation, and as opposed to what we have right now, which is absolutely woeful, uninformed, useless lawmakers, in Congress who are fighting each other rather than passing laws, actually doing something to have the backs of parents, of all those in society who worry about the harms being generated online. Peter, anything to add? Look, I'm not, I'm not a First Amendment uh, expert and America has its own unique traditions. I do think it's very important that democracies come together on a common vision around this sort of a baseline that we can agree on. Um, and, and I think it can be in line with, with First Amendment principles, with principles of universal freedom of expression. Um, I always like to put it this way, and it plugs into Imran's sort of question. I mean, let's go back to the right of the person online. At the moment when we're online, we don't understand who is behind the content that we're seeing. We don't understand who organizes conspiracy theory. We don't understand why it's targeting us and not the guy next door. We don't understand which of our data has been used to target us. We don't understand why an algorithm shows us one thing and not another. So weirdly, despite the seeming sort of like torrent of information, we actually don't have access to a lot of information. So let's start with that. That is still within the logic of the First Amendment. That's the demand for more information. Yeah. First Amendment and the Article 19 of the Declaration of Human Rights are about the right to receive information. So let's, if we ground things in the right of the citizen to understand who is influencing them and how, then, then I think, which is, you know, gets this transparency question straight away, then I think we are on, on really solid territory. I do think it's important for democracies, EU, US, Australia, and, and, and many other of our of our partners where these laws are being developed, there's a reason I named those countries, um, um, to be able to find a common baseline. And, you know, I, I spend a lot of my time thinking about authoritarian regimes. That's the sort of information that China and Russia don't want their citizens to have. They don't want their citizens to know how um, they are controlling their increasingly sort of separate digital space. I think it's a real opportunity to say, look, ours is different. It may be messy. Our information space was always messy. Well, there'll always be disinformation, but people have more rights in it. You know? That's also, you know, the right to receive counter information. So if you're receiving nonstop disinformation, I mean, should there be something built in which says that you, you, you receive uh, a balance to that as well? And you have a right to receive that. So let's go back to the right to the individual and, and see to what extent we can counter a lot of these issues by going back to those fundamental 
principles. Um, it's always going to be hard when we invent new ones. Um, let's interrogate the ones we have. If I could just add one point as well on the market driven solutions part of it. I mean, you don't government shouldn't be in the in the in the business of defining what speech is allowed and what speech is not. It really, really, really shouldn't. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you that you're a scumbag if you use identity based hate terms. I can tell you that you're spreading lies because I'm a private citizen. Oh, well, and, and my organization is a 501c3. We're allowed to communicate. It's part of the marketplace of ideas, right? And what's been quite interesting for CCDH is that we've been trying to, well, like what we're obsessed with is not just studying the spread of disinformation, but levers that we can we can increase friction, we can reduce the, 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 the promulgation of disinformation. So we, for example, go to advertisers and show them what we're finding. And those advertisers, as an example, when X was taken over by Elon Musk, there was a massive rise that we identified in the use of the N-word and other identity-based mm -hmm. hate terms. He lost 50% of his advertising as a result and had to make decisions based on it. You know, he had to bring in Linda Yaccarino and say that he was doing better. But the truth is that those sorts of solutions are very, very effective in driving change because, and they don't need government intervention at all. Although transparency would help us to do our job more effectively by because by having access to data guaranteed, we'd be able to do an even better job. Well, I think, unfortunately, we're uh, was near time here. So uh, instead of asking one more question, I'll say, is there any last word from Nelly? Otherwise, we're going to I'm going to close this out. No, I just want to thank uh, issue one for bringing this panel forward uh, and having these conversations. I think one of the more troubling things uh, that that happened to me when I was prepping for this was was to realize how little uh, of this conversation is happening right now in the United States, despite the fact that we're headed into a massive election cycle. And, you know, talking about it after the election cycle and learning what happened wrong is definitely not where I want our country to be. So yeah. thanks to issue one. No, thank you. Thanks, first of all, to all the audience members for joining us today, for your time, for your attention, for your interest. Apologies to those who asked questions and could not get them answered. Uh, it was a robust conversation. If you want to follow up with us offline, we were happy to forward those to the speakers or answer those ourselves. And thank you to the speakers for that really rich dialogue and conversation. Your, your expertise, your experiences are so impactful to this. Uh, we at the Council for Responsible Social Media are having these conversations. We are working actively to try to find solutions. That is what we're about, bipartisan ways to really move the needle and fix these major issues for our democracy, for our kids, and for U.S. national security. So again, want to thank you all for joining us uh, and wishing everyone a great rest of the day and a happy Thanksgiving.